Hey there, Scoobies. Wesley Wyndham Price was introduced during Season 3 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer to replace Giles as Watcher. New Watcher? New, New Watcher. Watcher. Screw that. After he was unceremoniously fired from the Watcher's Council. I've cited in previous videos that I believe Wesley Boy has one of the better character arcs in the Slayerverse. I previously made a comparison between Cordy and Buffy, indicating that Cordy started out in the show as a mirror to Buffy, a reflection of how she used to be. At Henry, I was prom princess, I was fiesta queen, I was on the cheerleading squad, and the yearbook was like a story of me. And I believe the same parallels can be seen between Giles and Wesley. Like the Buffy-Cordy relationship, the series uses Wes to show how much further Giles has come in terms of his own journey. And I don't believe the writers had much use for Wes beyond this. You're not helping. I know. I feel just sick about it. The theme of father-daughter relationships is strong within the season arc and highlighting Giles as their father figure to Buffy, a relationship that is built naturally. But this could have gone other disturbing ways. I gotta say, I'm impressed. Excuse me? Well, it's good to get the fruit while it's fresh. You'd be wise to take that back. Wes's attractions Cordy, Buffy's mirror, represents this potential and makes me wonder whether this has actually previously happened in this universe. In a weird way, it's fitting that there is a connection between these two characters considering what the future holds for them. During our introduction to Wesley, it's clear that he's a stickler for the rules. He quickly establishes that he, like Giles, is well read and, though intelligent, he does lack wisdom. Wes understands the issues at hand and the processes that are to be followed, but his lack of life experience makes him rigid. I have in fact faced two vampires myself. Under controlled circumstances, of course. No danger of finding those here. When Faith goes off the rails, the show paints Wes in an unflattering light, as it reveals him listening into Buffy and Giles' conversation, and then takes matters into his own hands. By the order of the Watchers Council of Britain. But let's take a moment to see the events from his position. It makes perfect sense for his character. He has lived by a set of rigid rules his entire life, and at his heart, Wes is a good person. He's trying to do what is right, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. By the season end, he is cut off from the council and a failure as a watcher. The council's orders are to concentrate on his orders. I don't think I'm going to be taking any more orders. Wes takes off to find himself. Time with the Scoob Gang gave Wes a taste of what life is like on the front lines. So then, when it comes to Angel, he meets a new, improved Wesley. To tell you the truth, I hadn't given it much thought one way or the other. At a time when Angel Investigations has lost a member of their ranks. Joining Angel is cathartic for Wes. He finds a place here where he could make use of his personal skill set. Any sudden movement, and I'll be forced to... Right? No, this whole thing, I... Please don't fire me. What happened yesterday was an anomaly. I am very rarely taken hostage. Like Giles before him, Wes's natural place is that of researcher. It's important to note that unlike Buffy, where the core Scoobies act as representations of the heart, mind and spirit, the employees of Angel Investigations don't have such close ties. This allows them to take character journeys that aren't so closely linked to Angel himself. This is not to say the core Scoobies are not characters in their own right, only that they were required to play dual roles much of the time. As we get further into Wes's story, we begin to see glimpses of childhood trauma. But I believe these signs are there from the beginning. My fault, I'm sure. Really? Cagey little brutes, aren't they? I'll wash them if you like, individually. They'll be just as good as new. Wes Better. Star. His desperation to help is telling of his psyche. It paints him as a follower rather than a leader. The same goes for his preppy mentality. On the surface, he seems like a spoilt brat, with a silver spoon in his mouth. But all this is nothing more than a costume he wears, the mask of civility in an attempt to make his father proud. The longing for acceptance is a driving force. Angel shows kindness and respect to him, despite his dorky behaviour. Well, I was lucky. I had a rogue demon hunter on my side. And so, he imprints his deep desire to impress on Angel. Uh. The episode I've Got You Under My Skin starts with Wes and Cordy fighting over her cooking. Angel lets out a slip. Cordelia, Doyle. And we see that it's equally awkward for Wes, who up until this point has been deeply trying to fit into the trio. 
The episode toys with the idea of the abusive father figure in a subversive manner, as it turns out he's not the problem. But it does give rise to this conversation. Who do we exercise? Which one's a demon? My father seemed kind of off. They were afraid of him. A father doesn't have to be possessed to terrorize his children. He just has to... This is the first hint of Wes's past, but later in the episode, the Ethros demon mocks Wes for his need to impress and hints at him being locked under the stairs as a child. All those hours locked up under the stairs and you still weren't good enough. Not good enough for Daddy, not good enough for the council. As Doyle once said, We all got something to atone for. Which brings us to the episode... 5x5. Five five. I'm not going to spend too much time on this now, as I will eventually get round to doing Faith and her story. But suffice to say, she is the thing that Wes has to atone for. His mistake in trying to arrest her and take her to be tried by the council resulted in her escape. Which in turn meant that all the hard work Angel had started, getting her to come to terms with what she had done, came crashing down. In a way, everything that Faith did after this point could be considered Wes's fault. <laughs> You know, I never thought to ask. By this point in the show, Wes has seen a few scrapes. But being tortured shows us just how much he has grown, especially in regards to his resilience. The following episode, Sanctuary, gives Wes a chance at redemption, as he is faced with a repeat of the first time that he dealt with Faith. Won't she find it difficult enjoying delicious jelly-filled donuts if she is, one assumes, bound and gagged? This time, making the right decision and fighting for her soul, despite what she's done. I do not, however, understand why the woman who brutally tortured me last night, this morning, gets pastries. The opening of the second season is a great way to show how far the team have come. And it's no different for Wes. After finally having plenty of hands-on experience, his self-confidence has come along. (laughs) And though played for laughs, the missed shot does show us that he still has a ways to go. In the episode Untouched, the team meet a girl with telekinetic abilities and some childhood trauma. This is the second time that we have seen reference to Wes's understanding of parental abuse. Why doesn't she go back to her friends? Toss the furniture about? Or maybe we should send you home to your father. What did you say to her? I mentioned her father. Well, who's her father? No, it's... The sort of trauma that can produce this level of psychic power usually involves abuse of some kind, very early on. In the episode Guys Will Be Guys, Wes pretends to be Angel while he is unavailable for the purpose of the story. I'm Angel. He is plain pretend of a figure that he looks up to. The double-edged sword of playing this part is that on the one hand, he genuinely gets to feel the catharsism of being the hero. I'm Angel, the vampire with a soul, fighting for my redemption with, with killing evil demons. Of saving the girl, of doing what's right. It also proves to him that he also has the ability not only to emulate the role, but to be the role. We have to go. Angel, you take gun, go to the front of the house. Cordelia will go to the back. Where's he? All right, I'm sorry. You know this sort of thing best. How should we proceed? Um, well, Gunn and I could... Take the back? Very good, let's go. Uh, Wesley, can I get my coat back? Although not overstated in the show, I think this only added to Wes's adoration of Angel, increasing the size of the pedestal that he places on him. We saw Wes transfer his need for approval from that of his father, and that of the council, and then to Angel. During season two, we see Angel sidetracked down a darker path. This will have a lasting impact on Wes, one that even we the viewer won't see until later on. We've seen that Wes sees his self-worth, through those that he looks up to. Angel acting as this representative means that his mission and the way he has comported himself throughout has had a positive effect on Wes's self-esteem and his place in the overall fight for good. This is, however, as I mentioned, a double-edged sword. Right now the three of us are all that's standing between you and real darkness. Best believe that, man. 
I do. You're all fired. Angel's abandonment of the team and Wes's subsequent injury shows him that good is corruptible. It pushes him to be more self-sufficient and the natural leader comes to the surface. I work for you. I just need to find a place for me to... I took the liberty of providing you with a new working space. Great. And I'd love a cup of coffee. <laughs> that's, that's very funny. But his idea of the hero is now corrupted too. Wes has gone through a fair few adventures by the end of season two, and here we see those experiences and his training begin to come together. It's Wes that makes the hard decisions. The guys you send to create those diversions are going to die. Yes, they are. You try not to get anybody killed, you wind up getting everybody killed. Taking on the role of the military general, he sends men to their deaths without batting an eye. The third season of the show continues to look at the themes of sin and atonement that have prevailed throughout, but pivoting to that of parenthood, and more prominently, the potential sins of the father. Wes has grown into his role of the de facto leader of the group. His defensive nature has matured with a level of self-confidence. Gun, I need you and Fred to go to the hotel and get me some books. I'll make a list. We need to research that Chinese coin. Angel, you find that demon and get the key. I'll... Wes shows understanding and compassion, but does not allow these traits to interfere with what he knows he must do. It's not very easy. A pull of divided loyalties. Another choice we do end up making, we feel as though we've betrayed someone. Yeah. If you ever withhold information or attempt to subvert me again, I will fire you. In the episode Billy, the antagonist has the power to turn men into violent misogynists purely by touching them. This is another key turning point in Wes's journey. The effect of Billy's power not only brings out these more visceral urges, but it leaves a raw awareness in him that he is capable of this kind of abuse, that deep, deep down, it's a part of him. This is compounded by the fact that his potential victim was someone that he cared deeply about. If you want to get to know Fred better, maybe the next time you have her over for an intimate dinner for two, you won't ask the rest of us <sighs> to come along. I don't know. I mean... Was I that obvious? <laughs> yeah! Yes! I don't think anybody else noticed. Fred's statement at the end of the episode feels like foreshadowing. I don't know what kind of man I am anymore. Well, I do. You're a good man. In the episode Waiting in the Wings, Wes is confronted with the notion of unrequited love, which many of us have faced at some point in our lives. It appears that their running with Billy had far-reaching effects, as it opened Fred's eyes to gun. Stick? You're a beast. Oh, come on. You know you're gorgeous. And placed a strain on her relationship with Wes. Seeing them together brings out his jealousy. He was obsessed with the girl. When he found her with the other man, he went insane with jealous rage. Pulled her out of time out of any reality beyond his theatre, his company. Once again, Fred says something at the end of this episode that foreshadows the future. Well, that's a surprise. I thought for sure she was meant to be with Angel. I guess you never can predict those things. You know? It is around this point Wes deciphers part of the Nyazian prophecy that indicated Angel would kill his son. This is a fact that takes Wes on a very different journey. I want to take a moment to recap some of the recent episodes and what we know about Wes at this point. A recent traumatic event has made him do something extremely shameful. We all got something to atone for. His affection for Fred wasn't returned. In fact, she is now with one of his best friends, creating a sense of distance. Cordelia is away. Let's get out of here. See ya. Who would have been the glue keeping the group together. Angel is the subject of his studies and acting a little strangely, drinking more than normal. Shh, shh, shh. 
Oh, it's all right. It's really not, Connor. Shut up! Don't yell at him. He's just a baby. If he keeps it up. He's not going to be a baby for long. He sought advice that he didn't think was helpful, even though he was given certain signs. But he ignored the warnings of betrayal in his future. When you take into consideration the nature of Wes's personal childhood trauma, his penchant for acting alone and desire to atone, his actions, all his actions, make perfect sense. Finally, I believe Wes was integral to Sargent's plan due to his history and his nature. Firstly, he needed Wes to figure out the Nyasian scroll and to translate the little message that they'd left for him to find, and then to take the relevant steps required for Holtz to obtain Connor. The episode Loyalty does more than just move the story along, it also demonstrates how far his competence has come. Maybe we should cut out his tongue. Yeah, I'll send a message to him jumps. Maybe. Or perhaps you could lie on the floor and gag for a while. In keeping with the season's themes, his conversation with Holtz speaks deeply to his concerns. When I put my son's body into the ground, I had to open the coffin just to know that he really was in there. You also may discover that a child's coffin, Mr. Wyndham Price, it weighs nothing. Some of Angel's actions lent into the idea that the prophecy may come true. Thought we were going to be trapped in there. At least I would have had something to snack on. Let's not also forget that a previous prophecy indicated that Angel would play a pivotal part in the apocalypse, but not what side. So you could argue that taking Connor could have been done by any of Team Angel had they had been introduced to all these facts. But I would argue not. Wes being a victim of abuse from his own father would drive him to seek to save the child. Fred's assertion that Wes should have spoken to them. He should have trusted us instead of going to halts behind our back. It's not in his nature, and his relationships to his friends were a little frayed at this time. The decision to follow through with this plan, to take Connor, is a defining moment. Betrayal and agony lie in wait. I just need to do this. And the consequences of that decision will forever change Wes's outlook. This isn't Angelus talking, it's me, Angel. You know that, right? Good. The person who he most looked up to tried to kill him, expelled him from his family, and they left him alone. There have been many points that have developed him, made him stronger. These were the moments that created a hole inside of him. The sense of abandonment and bitterness would be the perfect time for somebody with questionable morality to try and take advantage. But I figured you'd just tell me to go to hell, so I thought I'd just take a shot and drop by. Season 4 opens with Angel Dreaming. Though it becomes a nightmare, it begins showing us what's in his heart. They make a point of bringing Wes into the frame, showing us that deep down Angel forgives Wes for what he's done. This is notable as Angel has forgiven a man that hasn't forgiven himself. Wes's relationship with Lila represents a change in his mindset. Historically, he has looked to the rules, and straight-laced about his understanding of how those rules are to be implemented. Lila, being a lawyer, works within the confines of the law, the rules. But she is a corruption of the rules. Wes's infatuation with her is a mirror of the two sides of him that have now manifested. How you like the bad girls, Wes? I don't need to hear evil plans. No, it just turns you on knowing I have them. Shut up, Lila. Make me. From Wes's perspective, he was abandoned by his friends, left for dead by those that stood for the ideal. His worldview was suddenly shades of grey. What happened to you, man? I had my throat cut and all my friends abandoned me. At this point, we are now introduced to Wes's dual nature, and in my opinion, his true nature. His treatment of Justine is indicative of the years of abuse he received from his father. His reasoning and commitment to saving Angel still shows his need to do the right thing, even if his methods have been warped. I'll take away your bucket. In the episode Supersymmetry, Fred turns to Wes for help as she is consumed with vengeance. Wes acts as a voice of reason, and only a weak voice of conscience. 
It's not until later that Wes pulls his head up from the murky depths. I sometimes wonder if the events from the episode Spin the Bottle had anything to do with it. In the brief moment the gang's minds were restored to their younger versions of themselves, did it knock that forthright vision of right and wrong, black and white, back into the forefront? I believe a day of reckoning has arrived. Can you just reckon you'll toss in with the good guys? I'm choosing a side. We all got something to atone for. The only problem is... Funny thing about black and white. You mix it together and you get grey. And it doesn't matter how much white you try and put back in. You're never going to get anything but grey. And this nicely summarises the themes of the show. The bad guys don't win by vanquishing light. They do it through shades. But Lila goes both ways. In a bid to stop the beast, the gang bring back Angelus. As a former watcher, it's a high point. Angelus does a great job of hitting right to the heart of Wes's inadequacy, pointing out that all he has ever wanted to be was the hero. I'm Angel. <laughs> it's worth stating the obvious here. Wes is in love with Fred. I'm stating the obvious because he also loves Lila, which will be important later. Completing Wes's redemption arc, he goes to the one person that will help him get Angel back. With Lila's death, this is especially important. We all got something to atone for. And to him, this is the way to do it. Besides, Angel comes shining through in the end like he always does. Angel's gone, Faith. Angelus is back. Ironically, Wes has become Faith's perfect watcher. They are both tainted, and he understands her in a way that he never could have before. Maybe not. Ah! What are you doing, Wes? Shut up! So what? Torturing humans part of the new makeover? I did what I had to because you couldn't. I hit her. You think that's something new to her? You crossed it back there, Wes. What'd you oh, do Oh, you have there? a problem with a little torture now. Seem to recall a time when you rather enjoyed it. It goes right down to the roots, rotting your soul. That's why your friends turned on you in Sunnydale. Why the Watcher's Council tried to kill you. No one trusts you, Faith. You're a rabid dog who should have been put down years ago. <laughs> See? Wasn't so hard, was it? The show makes many references to Angel's brooding nature, but at this point in the show, Wes is doing most of the brooding, and for good reason. It does seem like you've given in to that grumpy side of the force. We each go through challenges in life, and oftentimes we look at ourselves and what we go through in a bubble. It's easy to get caught up in your personal drama when there is little to compare to. I had a woman chained in a closet. Oh, well, hey. No, it doesn't compare. No, dark, that's dark. You've been to a place. In the end, he says goodbye to the reform slayer. His job done, and the circle complete. Wes? Faith. So what more is there for the reformed watcher? In the season finale, Wes uses Wolfram and Hart's offer to attempt to release Lila from her contract. This act of kindness proves what I said before. Despite not being in love with her, he still loved her and cared for her. We see Wes's character arc over the course of the five seasons from bumbling British watcher, intellectual researcher, unassuming leader, stoic defender, ambiguous anti-hero, and finally redeemed hero. In the episode Lineage, Wes is confronted with the final remnant of his former self. His father comes to Wolfram and Hart to offer Wes a place back in the Watcher's Council, pending his evaluation of him. The episode begins with an arms deal gone wrong, showing Wesley has been watching too many John Woo movies. The scene serves as a visual reminder of the changes in Wes's nature. To think, I used to sell this guy collapsible swords. His calm, confident demeanour, backed up by the skills he's learnt over the course of the series. His back and forth with Angel, also evidence of the change in his outlook. Angel still sees Fred as a damsel. Wes sees her as an equal. Fred has more than proven herself in the field. There was no reason to We think. found her bleeding to death on the ground. Caught off guard, Wes appears to revert to the clumsiness of his past. This appears to be a natural regression. For the most part, his father just seems to be overbearing and critical. So why the hints of trauma? To a child, the admiration and respect of your parents can be all-encompassing. An overly critical parent in this manner can be a destructive force. This exchange is another nod to how much Wes has changed. What do you think you're doing? I had attack priority. We're not fencing. We still follow the basic rules. No longer obsessed by the rules, but getting the job done. In the episode's third act, when Fred is threatened, 
Wes doesn't hesitate. Wes has never been able to tell Fred how he really feels. The words escape him. The timing is wrong. Actions speak louder than words. Since meeting Fred, Wes always seemed to stand in his own way, to the point of being romantically clueless, even when Fred is thrown out more than a few signals. I was thinking... Of course. Maybe you and I, we could... Yes, Miss Burkle needs a driver to take her home tonight. But I, I'm not really looking for so much as looking... Hang on. And now... And now... You better get some rest. No telling when the next crisis will strike. Wes has come a long way in almost every area, but there is a blocker in this case. Like his mind is shielding it from him, because deep down he feels like he isn't worthy of her. And after the man has gone through so much, there is only one thing left undone. And he finally gets... Uh, oh, screw it. And there you have it. That concludes Wes's story. From bumbling watcher to key player in the ongoing fight against evil. And he even got the girl in the end. You make me happy. There is a cynical lesson in life that comes to us all eventually. It's not a Disney fairy tale, despite who now owns the IP. Life is cruel. If I looked at Wes's journey and was able to boil it down into a statement, it would be something like this. We learn from our mistakes, and we are only as wise as our experiences. Wesley made many mistakes, and by the end of the series, his experience is vast. He is unrecognisable. But at the core, he remains much the same as he ever was, and he will always do whatever it takes. Hello there. Wesley. Fred.